Thank you for tuning in to Walk in Truth Dig Deeper Bible Study. We hope you will learn to love the Word of God as we study, line by line, verse by verse. Come and join us on the exciting journey through the Word of God. Let's see what God is trying to tell us today. Today, <laughs> that's what I always say, don't we? We're going to get through first, first Peter chapter 2 today. Amen. Praise God. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I am so happy um, that everybody is here today. Uh, and welcome to Walk in Truth Christian Fellowship Church. Dig deeper Bible study. We've been studying First Peter. We talk, we've been talking about um, the privileges, the advantages, and the rights of God. And what I'm going to talk about today is on those lines too. This whole book is about that. Um, the privileges, advantages, and rights. And now we're going to get into the privileges, advantages, and responsibilities of God. We already talked about the car. Committed, consistent, accountable, responsible. Uh, the benefits, advantages, and rights. Now we're going to talk about the benefits, advantages, and the responsibility of having the benefits and, and advantages. The, the benefactor is Jesus. We are the beneficiary. And the benefits so far come from a uh, living, we're born into a living hope, through a living word, to a living stone. Okay. That's how we are born. So, uh, Sister, Sister Frida, go ahead and pray us in. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for allowing us this time to gather and focus on your word. Um, we pray that you allow us to tune in and open our ears and our hearts to receive what it is that you would have us learn tonight. Pray that you be with the speaker and strengthen him to teach. And um, we just thank you for this time we get to spend. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All righty. So let's go ahead and start at verse 10. Uh Frida, let's start it. Let's start at verse nine. Let's start at verse nine and read nine through twelve. Coming from the NASB. Mm -hmm. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, mm -hmm. so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Mm -hmm. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Amen. So let's stop right there. And it tells us that uh, benefit, advantage, but you are a race, a royal priesthood, you were not God's people, but now you are God's people. That's the benefit of the new birth. That's the benefit of being born again. That's the benefit of being born to a living hope through the living word. When you were outside of the commonwealth of Israel, when you had no hope, when you were a Gentile without a God, God saved you through his resurrection. He saved you by mercy. OK, so the benefits or that we are chosen now in God, a royal priesthood, a precious uh, a possession of God. So in that benefit comes the responsibility. It's just like anything else you join. Uh, at your jobs, you have the benefit of working for pay, but there also comes a responsibility. If you join a fraternity, there's benefits and advantages, but then there's also responsibility. So we have to understand when Peter's talking, he's given us the benefits but now Peter is going to go broadly into the responsibilities and then he's going to get narrow in our responsibilities with always keeping in mind that we belong to God. We are his possession. And when you understand how you're his possession, then you can understand how how you may walk in the benefits and advantages along with carrying the responsibility. But first, we have to do something. I, I didn't cover some passages earlier because I wanted to go back. Once we got into this benefits, advantages and rights. But first, we have to put on put off something. First, we have to deal with ourselves and say, when I'm acting in this, when I'm when I'm not acting as God want me to, then I forfeit walking in the benefits, advantages and rights. Now, you still save, but you lessen the impact of being part of God's uh, uh, children, God's 
in, in an heir of a throne. You know, just like anything else, when we act contrary to what we're involved in, then we lose the uh, 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 the effectious, effectiveness of our benefits, okay, our, our advantages, our rights. So go all the way back to, to chapter, go stay in chapter two, but start at verse one. Watch this. It says, put away. Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. See, and that if should be a sense. If you have tasted, since you have tasted the kindness and the goodness of the Lord, which is also in Isaiah, if you, in the, I mean in the Psalms, then you are desiring the milk, the pure milk of the living word. Okay? You are desiring, just like a baby, just like little Ferris when she was little smaller, when she saw that bottle or saw something she wanted, she kicked, she moved her hands, she started verbalizing. And the same we should be in Christ Jesus. When we come to Christ as newborn babes, haven't you noticed you're more excited in the beginning, but you, you lose that excitement as you go through. But we should always maintain that excitement. Desiring that pure milk, which is the word of God. But that same milk turns into meat. We should mature it. We should not always be babies in Christ. We should mature into Christ, but desire that milk since we've tasted that the Lord is good. Okay? Since, not if. Because if, if there's a question if you have, that means we have to question your salvation. But that word if should be more like since you've tasted that the Lord is good, there should be some things that you should put off. That malice, that envy. Put that off. Because when you if you don't put that off, you you will not fully develop as an adult into this into this salvation that we're responsible for because it tells us to work out our own soul salvation we will always be infants and there are a lot of people that are in church that's been in church all their life that haven't matured they are still infants they're saved but they haven't bought into the responsibility the benefits the advantages and the rights of growing up and being mature the more mature you are in christ the better you can take advantage of the benefits the advantages and the rights and there's a responsibility to that you don't just do this uh, uh, willy nilly. You understand that there is a responsibility to being an adult in Christ Jesus, to maturing in Christ Jesus. Let's go back. So we his precious possession, but we need to take put off those things that are part of our passions and our flesh and our desires. It's going to tell us that. Go ahead. What verse you on there? 11. 11. Go ahead. Beloved. I urged you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. So it's always a battle going on with inside the saint. He's urging you, put away that malice, but also wait, put away those passions that lead you into those destructive behaviors that, that keep you from having the relationship with God that you want to have and that he wants to have with you. Okay. That's part of that root. We have to we put the death. We have to lay the axe at that root of sin that keeps us out of that uh, uh, outward expression of sin in our life. The jealousy, the envy, the malice towards other people. OK, because it's important that people see your light and people can't see your light. If you're hypocritical in your walk with God, one day you're, you're doing good deeds. And the next day you're showing envy and jealousy. And it's a shame that the body of Christ at times with each other. We show envy and jealousy towards each other. We look at each other's gifts and we 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 envy and want that person's gift or we put down that person's gift because our gift is not shining amongst the people as brightly as theirs. But we should all take be be happy to to be in the body and do what we supposed to do, because it's not the ones who shine the most who counts, but it's all of us working together to glorify God. So he says, I urge you to put that. Put that fleshly passions aside so that you can continue to grow. So he's still talking about how you can grow. But there's a war going on with you. You That war will go on in you until the day you close your eyes. Okay, But the key to the war is your little victories, your little victories, your little victories. Because the war is going to be won. The war is already won. But you have to live it out in your life. That's the maturity walk. That's the suffering walk. That's the way into which we mature. We fight these wars. And part of the war is like we learned Suffer well, okay? Suffer well, suffer well, grow up, 
Learn how to suffer because this is the way that God tells us that we are validated through how we suffer well. But we also, there's some benefits that God says that we get because we become priests. We become his possession. We can offer up spiritual uh, 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 blessings to him. There's a whole bunch of benefits that we have, but it still comes through the suffering way and putting away those things of the flesh. Go ahead. Keep your behavior excellent mm -hmm. among the Gentiles so that in the, in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may... They may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them. So, so what we do is we do good. In the, in, in, in the midst of the persecution, we do good. Now that we put these things away, now you're in a position to be persecuted. Okay? You're in a position to be persecuted. Because if you're doing wrong, you're being prosecuted. But if you're doing the things of God, you're going to be talked about. You're going to be laughed at. You're going to be scorned. But those things validate us because that's part of the suffering. We have to suffer through the world, but we shouldn't have to suffer through each other. We shouldn't be do. We shouldn't have to do good deeds to show each other that we are part of the body of Christ. That should be a thing that comes natural in the sense of we're all filled with the Holy Spirit. So if you're not in tune with the good deeds of the body of Christ, then what you need to do is relent, repent and give yourself more. Surrender more to the power of the Holy Spirit through his word. We got to remember a living hope through a living word. The more words you have in you, the, build, the bigger, the stronger the house is going to be the temple of God. Don't you know that you are the temple of God? Well, what's in the temple of God? It has to be God's word. Not your imagination, not, not, not your religious rituals, but the stronger your house is to withstand the wiles of the devil and the temptation of the devil. Like put on the full armor of God. It tells us what's the point so that we can withstand the wiles of the devil, the, the, the temptations of the devil. But it only comes from strengthening ourselves through eating the milk of the word and then the meat of the word. Once you get to the meat, you'll be stronger. But it's the same word. It's funny. People say, is there a different word as meat and milk? It's the same. The same milk that you that you chew on when you were a child as you in Christ, as you grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that same scripture through revelation becomes meat to you. You have a deeper understanding where uh, at first you just understood it at, at the milk level, but that same scripture be can become a meat, uh, a diet, uh, meat and potatoes meal for you. Okay? So I want to encourage you. It's not, well, I'm looking for meat scriptures versus milk scriptures. No, all of it's the same. It's just that your level of revelation, it's it's how it's presented to you, how your understanding is. It's like a child. You, you, you know, when you you might want to chew up your child's food till they get some teeth and then they still eat steak, <laughs> but it's been chewed up. You know, you present it to them. But it's through the revelation that she gets. She has actually I got teeth now. I could chew my own food, you know, and the goal is for you to chew your own food. OK, we guide you to God. And then the Holy Spirit guides you into a, a stronger relationship through the revelation of the word of God. That's what you grow your house on. That's what you dine on. That's what you taste and see that the Lord is good. OK, it's not by anything that is done outwardly. It's the it's the inward sanctification through the word of God that you taste and see that the Lord is good. Go ahead. He's going to explain it some more. Go ahead. Glorify God in the day of visitation. Mm hmm. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. So the way we combat things that we don't like, we do good. And it tells us to obey our civil authorities. OK, I know a lot of people have a problem with that, but that's what God saying. Your argument is with God. It's not about the civil authority that you want uh, in office in America. It's the fact that God has ordained all government. And if there's somebody in power that you have a problem with, you take that up with God. And you vote the way you want to vote, but you take it up with God when your side loses. Well, you know what? I'm on neither side. I'm on God's side, so I always win. See, that's when you mature. you on God's side. Whatever God say, I'm fine with if God wants to appoint someone to whoop on us, to get us to bow our knee, praise God. If God wants to 
put us in a time where we're so prosper, prosper, prosperous we can't uh, even tie our shoes, we so fat. Well, great, but we know that through reading Judges that during that prosper, prosperity time, what happens? Nine times out of ten, you turn away. It's only through the pressures that you keep your knees bowed. It's only through the time that you're going through something. So government, what it does is it regulates that for God. It is it 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 brings it's supposed to bring justice to the evildoers and then bring praise to those who do right. Okay, go ahead. For such is the will of God. Oh, okay, that's okay. Verse sixteen: Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Now, you're free. In Christ Jesus, there are things that you can do. The Bible says that all things are lawful to us, but all things are expedient for us. Well, you are free to do anything you want to do, but you have to weigh out through your maturity. Is it worth doing? If saints would just sit back and take their time to think about what they do before they do it and ask themselves, does this honor God or does this disgrace God? And we don't need to put on people our hang ups or our little uh, points of view about what a Christian should be. Okay, quit doing that. You ain't you. You're not really qualified to do that. Because if you're not doing what you say, and you say, well, we should be doing this, or the church should be doing this, then you do it. <laughs> Show us by example. Don't come to me talking about what the church did in in Acts. Man, do you know the first the first sin, uh, uh, Ananias and Sapphira? What happened? They got the Holy Spirit killed them. The church has never been perfect. Never. So this thing of going back, the church is always going to progress. We're progressing towards the return of our Lord and Savior. We can't go back. But we can live on the values. We can stand on the rock and become living stones. But we have to go by what the words say. And some of us make judgment. I hear it out of the mouths of saints all the time. So judgmental and don't know enough word to even be judgmental. Not even judge themselves by what they say. If you judge yourself by what you say, that's the part where the Bible tells us that before I can move, remove what's in your eye, I got to remove what's in my eye. I got to remove the bigger thing that's in my heart, in my eye, in my mind before I even deal with you. It doesn't say that I can't deal with you, but I have to be honest about my own sin, my own self, my own hang ups. And if you if you're honest about your own hang ups, you can live free. And when you live free, you don't take advantage of it to do anything. You want to please God. So our freedom is free in the sense that we live to please God. That that if we have a chance to please God versus pleasing flesh, we will please God. And therefore, our freedom is, 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 is we enact our freedom, our freedom to choose to follow the Holy Spirit. Before you got saved, before you were his people, before you was his possession, before you were uh, a royal priesthood, before you were a living stone, you didn't have no freedom. All you could do is sin. You couldn't please God because it says right there, you are you are aliens from him. You were separated from him. You were separated from the commonwealth of Israel. But now through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you have the benefit of being one of his children and the responsibility. OK, you have the responsibility to be one of his children. Now he's given us what we're responsible for. Go ahead. Honor all people. Mm -hmm. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Mm -hmm. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. Mm -hmm. For this finds favor if for the sake of conscience towards God, a person bears up sorrows when suffering unjustly. So when you suffer unjustly, you have to bear the sorrow from suffering unjustly and doing right by everyone. Honor everyone. Because in, in verse seven, it says the honor is ours. So that's one of the things we give away. God has given us honor because we're in Christ Jesus. That's part of the benefit. That's part of the advantage. Now, what's our responsibility to honor those who the world says we shouldn't honor? Now, that's a hard thing for us to do. Because we want to honor who we want to honor. See, I can give honor to anyone. Even a heathen. Because God has honored me. And it's not my honor. It's his. 
The righteousness that you do have is imputed to you. You didn't earn it. He died for it. So if he honors you and he tells you to honor the those who you would normally honor, how dare you take his honor and say, oh, yeah, well, I'm going to wear it on my sleeve and be above the people. The issue with the church is we need to get back to, into serving people and not look to be served. Not look to be put up front. Not look to be our, our Lord and Savior what came to serve, not to be served. He came to save. You know what I'm saying? So with that, our obligation, our our responsibility, because we are, again, I'm going to keep saying it, uh, a living stone through a living word to a living hope. Because we are that, we are that, and we are this royal priesthood, we should be the first ones to understand what people are going through that are not in the body of Christ. And really understand what the saints go through. Because just because you a saint don't mean that you're not going to sin no more. Okay? But as a saint of God, you don't practice sin so that grace may abound. Okay? You don't use it as an excuse. All that, I'm a work in progress, that's a fact. But you don't use that to sin. Because the minute you use it to sin, you stop being a work in progress. You just a sinner. You admit it, you repent, and you move on. And we don't use repentance like we should. Because repentance truly means a change in direction. No reason for you coming to say you're sorry and you're remorseful. There's a difference between being remorseful and being repentive. Okay? If you're repentive, then you could reach out to that man or woman who needs your help. But if you're just remorseful about your sin, then you're going to be a hard you go It's going to hard for you to be an effective witness because when you're remorseful, guess what? You're going to double down on it the next time. <laughs> well, you told pastor the first time, but the next time you ain't going to make that same mistake. You, you don't know what the Holy Ghost made you tell me the first time. The next time you're going to resist that, and keep it to yourself and do what you want to do. But we got to work. We got to we got to got a war going on, Sister Frida. Brother, we got a war going on inside of us. It, it don't stop. You never reach perfection, okay? You never reach that. Everything you got that's perfect is imputed to you. You didn't earn it, and you can't. Because still, all your works are like filthy rags unless they come under Jesus, under the blood of Jesus. Okay? All right, go ahead. 20. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? Mm -hmm. But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it. Mm -hmm. This finds favor with God. Now, it, it's funny to me. I watch people who do wrong. And I've done this too, so I'm not saying, but okay, let me use me for example. I've done wrong and got in trouble for it. And endured the consequences. Easy. Endured it. Took the whooping. Took the spanking. Took the chastisement. Took the restriction. Whatever. And endured it. But. When I do right. And I'm persecuted. Then I fall apart. Because what happens. When you do right. You think that you shouldn't be persecuted. You think that everything should go the way you expect it to go because you did good. But the Bible says, what good is that that you endured when you do wrong? And then when you do good and, and, and wrong is done against you, you fall apart. That's what you got to grow up into maturity. You got to expect when you're doing good, Sister Frida, as you know, that as you're doing good and trying to do good, evil is always present trying to drag you back. Into your passions. Always. Always trying to drag you back. And you got to learn how to fight that thing. With the word of God. In you. Strong enough to say you know what. Make an excuse. Whatever it is. Even if it's, even if it's not a true. You know what I'm saying. Get out of that situation. Get away from that circumstance. Don't let that thing take you over. You have a choice now. That's the beauty about it. You free. See the Bible says you free. And this is how you free. You're free from the power of sin. Let, let sin not have any reign over your mortal body. You're, and you, uh, 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 you're free from the penalty of sin. But you're not free from the presence of sin. You're not going to pay the penalty. And sin should not have any power over you. So you got a choice. Before, you were not free from sin. 
and sin did reign in your mortal bodies and you had no choice. You thought you was making a choice, but you really made a choice for sin 99 percent of the time that I mean, I'm going to tell the truth. I ain't going to sit here and act like I was holy. I wasn't. And neither were y'all. OK, to tell the truth. Yeah. And again, there's a difference between going to church and, and doing things God way. They can work together, but don't think that one is one qualifies you when you haven't dealt with sin. It's so it's an interesting to me. It's quite fascinating to me when I deal with people and they tell me about their salvation. And the first thing they start off with is the church they go to. And they will never mention sin. They'll mention the baptism. They'll mention they'll mention the uh, uh, church they go to. They'll mention how many people they got in the clergy and their family. They'll do all of that. But but that's not salvation. That's being churched. And there's nothing wrong with being churched. But I asked you about your salvation. And unless your salvation includes sin, you, you still may be lost. Your flesh does not want to admit it's a sinner. Trust me. That's a supernatural thing when you could come to God and say, I'm a sinner. And, it, and if it ain't, if it not, if it wasn't for you, Jesus, if I took another breath and you decided to come back, I would bust hell wide open. That's when you know you say. When you know that there was a time you might not remember the date, but you have come to that conclusion. If God didn't save you and he came back to judge at that next breath, that you would go to hell because you Stayed away from God. You didn't want his love. You wanted to do what you wanted to do. Again, back to judges. See, everything works together. Everyone does what is right in their own eyes. Yeah, you, you'll say some things as church and, and Bible, but it's not in your heart. Your heart, your lips, the Bible talks about. You give him lip service, but your heart is far, far, far from him. And you can normally tell when you get mature. Discernment will tell you whether this person is serious or whether this person is just a people pleaser. I have to smile regardless. There was a time when I would call that out automatically, but I've learned that even the person who's a people pleaser that is not there yet, they may be saved, but they haven't given their completely given up themselves to God. And that's a process of whoopings. OK, and God will whoop on you to you bend your knee. He said he chastises the, those he loves. And if he doesn't love you, you're like a bastard to him and he'll let you go on your way. He'll let you go on your way. And you think that you saved and you're not. OK, but those who are saved, you're guaranteed to be chastised by God. Now, there's a difference. Persecution is part of the chastisement. He'll use other people outside sources to persecute you, just like he used Nebuchadnezzar. And everybody, all the, the the ites to come against Israel to get Israel to turn back to God. OK, so this gospel for us keeps us turned to God and the gospel for the unbeliever turns them to God. Same gospel. One, it helps build us up and strengthens us and gives us confidence. The other, it saves them. It takes them from from death to life. OK. That's what you have the responsibility to do. You, you don't have to do another miracle. The miracle is when you take a person who's dead in their sins and trespasses and you give them the gospel that takes them into eternal life to be with God. That's the biggest miracle you can do. It's not about anything physical. That's why you have the stories in the gospels of Jesus healing people. And then he would he would he would almost challenge them and say, is that all you think your biggest problem was you were lame? You think your biggest problem was that you was blind? You think your biggest problem is that? No, that's not your biggest problem. Your biggest problem is that if you continue to sin, you'll miss out on the kingdom of God. And that your lameness or whatever's wrong with you will, will be small in comparison to missing out on being in the kingdom. See, we can't imagine that. We can't imagine being a paraplegic and that's not the worst thing that can happen to you because we're fleshly creatures. And with the fall of Adam, it reversed. I was teaching somebody this the other day. When Adam walked with God, his spirit ruled his flesh. When Adam sinned, his flesh ruled, it, ruled over the spirit. His flesh was elevated. That's why he knew he was naked. He was always naked, but he became ashamed once his flesh was so prevalent in his life because the spirit of God had left. The spirit of God had left him. That's why in the Old Testament you see the, the spirit coming upon people. They weren't residing in people. But through Jesus Christ and those of us who are saved, you the temple of God. It's not in the house anymore. It's in you. Okay. All right. Go ahead. 
For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Now, 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 that was a lot said, but simply this. He was the pattern. We follow the pattern. He died to sin. So we died to sin. It said that we were buried with him and raised with him. We 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 are part of his resurrection. And and because we're part of his resurrection, we walk like he walked. OK, that's walking in the light. When the Bible tells us walking in the light, you're walking in the death, burial and resurrection of Christ. That's the light. OK, he is our pattern of conduct. So the more you understand the cross, the more you understand your conduct. It's not it's not about this, 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 this social a uh, 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 justice thing that they're trying to put on Christians. No, it's about saving souls. Because if you think about it, Sister Frida and Lloyd, you think about this. If Jesus came for social justice, let's measure what he accomplished. He didn't free him from Rome, did he? He didn't free him from the persecution of the Jews, did he? Poor people, there were still poor people, right? Because he said, the poor you have what you always, right? So, that couldn't have been his mission. It was bigger than that. Did he heal some people? Yes. Did he heal a lot of people? Yes. But he had the power. He could have healed everybody he want in, the, in the world. But he didn't because his mission then was to provide a way for mankind to be reconciled back to God, to restore the relationship. And that needed a death. Without the blood, there is no remission of sins. And the blood of bulls and goats had played out for God. God the Father said, I'm tired of that because you guys are are starting to you idolize the, the, the ritual versus understanding that those were shadows of the Messiah to come. And you got has a ritual to show bread and all of that, the temple of God. And he said, I am the resurrection. And John, he said, I am the resurrection. They couldn't see it because what happens is that we can get so close and miss the pattern through our rituals. And not get the substance of who Jesus is. See, you're too busy trying to, to manipulate him into giving you what you want versus trying to get what he's trying to give you. He's trying to give you a peace that surpasses all understanding, but he can't give you that and necessarily give you the prosperity that is fleshly. Because the peace that surpasses only all understanding comes from suffering. And through prayer and taking your supplications to God with thanksgiving. How can I give God thanks when I'm going through through, through so much? That's that that messes with our mind psychologically. You mean I'm gonna thank you while I'm going through so much and I'm suffering? Yep. If you're a child of God, you will. Because you know that there's a peace to be to be gained. But if I'm marginally just in church, I go to church so I can get blessed. I go to church so I can have something. I go to church because I want to be counted and I want the people to see me. But you should be coming to church to fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ to strengthen them and to get strengthened. There's a benefit for the church coming together, the fellowship. But you do good deeds because he did good deeds. You suffer because he suffers. Okay, go ahead. We're going to finish this today. Amen. Um, verse what? 24. 24. All right. Two more verses. All right. Uh, Start at 23. Well, I'm, well, yeah, finishing 24. Start at 23. 23. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. Mm -hmm. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Mm -hmm. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds, we, you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep. But now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your soul. Amen. So it tells us that when he was talked against, when he was persecuted, he didn't do anything back. He went to the cross without saying a mumbling word. 
Can we really do that? Do we know how to do that when we're persecuted? I'm not talking about when you do wrong, because when you do when you do wrong and you're prosecuted, you got a lot to say. And when you think that you've done good and something goes wrong, you got a lot to say. But can you understand that validates who you are when you suffer like Christ, especially for the cause of Christ, for saving souls? There are people that's going to come against you. There's people that will talk about you. And there's people that's going to look at you and ask you, how can you sit here and smile while everything else is falling apart? Because you trust God. Who did he say he entrusted? He entrusted the one who had the power. That's what that was saying. He entrusted the one who makes the decisions. He entrusted the one who said, let there be light. He entrusted himself to, to the mission that God the Father had put him on and the resurrection that was promised to him. OK, and that's what we have to do, because God is the captain of our soul. OK, Jesus is that captain for our soul. And like every like sheep, we all have gone astray. That last passage, uh, Lord, go to Isaiah 53 and six and read that. Isaiah 53 and six. That's where that passage comes from. Free to go to Isaiah 53 and six. We want to finish this. Whoever get there first. It's going to say, like sheep, we all have went astray. Go ahead. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Mm -hmm. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Mm. So where does our iniquity fall? Where does our sin fall free to, on him? But like all the time, we've gone astray. Just like in Judges, they kept going astray. And Jesus said, look, they ain't going to never get it right. I'm going to let their sin fall on me. How magnificent the cross is. Because all our iniquity, all our sin, all our, 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 our things to be judged upon was put upon Christ, an innocent man that did no wrong, who suffered physically, emotionally here on earth at the hands of his own people. All to save the whole world. That's why John 3, 16, the deeper God so loved the world. And then it talks about the fact that if you don't believe in what he did at the cross, that 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 you're condemned already. There's not a religious activity that you could do to prove that you are saint. I don't care how many whatever you want to do. But it has to be an understanding that we do good deeds because he did good deeds. We suffer because he suffered. We are raised because he's raised. And no matter how much we are suffering, whether persecuted or prosecuted, we understand that the last say so in our judgment is Christ. And he's going to judge us innocent before God. So there's no reason for us not to use our freedom to continue to do what's right in the eyes of men and show them that we're children of God no matter what goes on. We're not a Democrat. We're not a Republican. We're not a Jew. We're not a Gentile. We're not male. We're not female. We are all in Christ Jesus, meaning that those of us in Christ Jesus have a responsibility to always let our light shine and show that we belong to Christ. And when our light is not shining, we need to check ourselves. Now, does that mean you walk around here like a Cheshire cat and all the time? No, it doesn't mean that. You tell the truth on how you feel, but you understand that your solution to feeling better, to getting better is through Christ Jesus. He said by his stripes, we were healed. And we use that phrase out of pocket in this context, in the context that is given in the Old Testament. He's not talking about by his stripes, we we're healed from affliction of the flesh. No, no. Our greatest problem is sin. By his stripes, we have been made alive and are healed from being dead in our sins and trespasses. Can you use it for that? Yes. But the most powerful way to use it is use it like it's in scripture. It is, it is the healing that the blood gives us from sin. Without any blood, there's no remission of sin. His blood, his one drop, gave us an opportunity, gave us a way, gave us the the, the, the benefit, the advantage, and the right, and the responsibility to be committed, accountable, and responsible to God. And if you get us from a car and bar and explain it to people, you go a long way to getting people saved because that's the gospel. He gave us this in his death. 
He gave us the ability to be committed, accountable, responsible, to have the benefits, the advantages and the rights and the responsibility. So you have to decide today what you're going to do. I want to encourage those who are listening around the world. Decide today. If you hear God's voice in this, harden not your heart. Come to God. For those of us who are saved, ask God to forgive you right now for your sins and repent and turn. Don't ask him to forgive you for something you're going to keep on doing. Because you're not repentant. Ask God to drive you to repentance to turn your mind. And I want to tell you, you don't really, you're asking him, you, and what you're not really asking him to do is forgive you because he's already forgiven you. What you're asking to do is you need to experience the revelation of your forgiveness. Because he's already forgiven you. But you don't feel it. But you got to get past feeling and get into faith. I'm going to say that again. You got to get past your feelings and get into faith. Because by faith, I, I believe that I'm forgiven. You see what I'm saying, Sister Frida? I'm, I believe I'm forgiven. Now, I might not feel it, but I know that I'm forgiven. And as my faith grows, guess what? I'm going to tell you this. As my faith grows, I start feeling it. And when I start feeling it, somehow I move in it. And my faith becomes stronger. And my faith becomes the way I dictate my life versus the way I feel at any given moment in time. Like Lord, you said about when you came, you know, when you said to me, I look stressed. No, I'm not stressed. I'm serious about this. My faith makes me serious, somber. But I'm, as you see, I'm, I'm very happy because my faith has made me joyous that I believe that God has graced us right now with this word that could help somebody. That's why I'm serious about this word, because it's the only thing that can kill you, cure you. And it'll kill you, too, if you don't accept it. <laughs> it's a double-edged sword. The same word to cure you is the same word that will cut you, but it'll build you up. It'll bring you to your knees, but it'll also build you up. So I want to encourage your body today. Continue to love God. Continue to trust God. Always want you to be encouraged, be blessed, and be at peace. And always remember to walk in truth. I'm going to pray us out, and then we're going to bring the people on the phone back on to see if they got to say anything. I want to thank those who are listening around the world and continue to uh, subscribe, share, and like on our many platforms, our, our, our YouTube page, our Walk of Truth Radio Network YouTube page. Please go over there, subscribe, share, and like, and share, share, share. All right, let's pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you. I thank you for your word that's went forward today. I thank you for this lesson. I thank you for finally getting into chapter three. <laughs> and uh, Lord, there's so much still to unpack in one and two, but Peter's truly trying to show us there's a better way to suffer, suffer well. And Peter's trying to tell us why the benefits of suffering well, the advantages of suffering well, the responsibility and the rewards and the rights of suffering well. One, that we got a living hope. Lord, thank you, Jesus, for that. Through a living word, thank you, Jesus, for that. And thank you for making us living stones attached to the chief cornerstone, which is you. The one that the builders rejected. Lord, let us wear that and do good deeds towards others that others may see our light shine. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Again, thank you guys for tuning in. God bless you and talk to you later. Peace. We like to thank you for listening to the Walk in Truth broadcast. Our worship service is held every Tuesday and Sunday at the Universal Church of Jesus Christ Building. Located at 2301 Wallace Avenue, Overland, Missouri, 63114. Tuesday's Bible study is at 7 p.m. and Sunday worship at 8.30 a.m. All are welcome. If you would like to donate to this ministry please look in the description box and donate on your favorite platform of choice. Continue to listen to us on our Walk in Truth Radio Network YouTube page and on our Walk in Truth Christian Fellowship Facebook page. Please subscribe to either platform to be notified when we are broadcasting. We again want to thank you for your prayers and your continuous support. May God bless you, keep you and always remember, walk in the truth of the Lord Jesus and be at peace.